Good morning, everybody. We are moving on to a new position today for the draft, and this one is, at this point, you can't say it's quite as dire as nose tackle, but it's pretty dire. And I think that some people are going to look at what we did in free agency and probably assume we did a little more than we actually did to make things better. I'm talking about defensive end. And of course, I'm talking about defensive end in the context of a 3-4 defense, which it seems like we're sticking with. So understand that a defensive end in a 3-4 is different from an edge player. They typically fill very different roles. They do very different things. And a lot of the time there's, you know, crossover between a 3-4 defensive end and a 4-3-3 tech, maybe a 5 tech, sometimes even a 1 tech, honestly. It really just kind of depends on what you need in your particular defense, the way in which you're running it. So definitely understand that what we are looking for here, it, it, there's not one exact profile type of player that we're looking for here to fill our 3-4 defensive end needs. We are definitely looking for a wide variety of potential pieces. Now, with that being said, me saying that is basically an acknowledgement that we're going to be looking at a lot of players over the next few days. Let's look at what we have right now. You've got Draymond Jones, who, I, he's a great player. He's been great in uh, uh, Denver, and I think he'll be great here. No problem with that. But after that, we have a problem. The next man up is uh, Jaron Reed, who, at this point in his career, probably shouldn't be a starting defensive lineman in the NFL. Or if he is starting, he should not be playing a massive amount of snaps. I've said this before, but the last two years, uh, Jaron Reed has played about 42 snaps a game. And I'm going to say it right now, that's probably way too much. If you could get that number down to like 30, I think he could start to give you plus play. But you're not going to do that if he is your secondary defensive end. If he's literally the only other reliable defensive end you have on the team. So we have a problem. We also have the... First man off the bench, the d defensive end three, if you will, Miles Adams, a guy who I thought played okay last year at times. I liked what I saw from him. I'm excited to have him back for a really cheap price, but he's done very, very little in this league, and there's no way I'm going to bet the future on him. And then defensive end four is Gerard Hewitt, who does not belong anywhere near an NFL roster and should be on a practice squad. So... We probably need two more good defensive linemen so Reed can become defensive end four and Adams can become defensive end five if you really want to have a great defensive line. So with that in mind, let's take a look at some of these prospects and we're going to spend this whole video probably talking about this one guy because everybody in Seahawks Nation is thinking about this guy right now, talking about this guy, wondering about this guy. So I'm just probably going to earmark this whole video just for this guy. It's Jalen Carter, and this is such an important evaluation for us to make because there is a scenario where we draft Jalen Carter and he never does anything, and then we ended up wasting a top five pick and the crown jewel of the Russell Wilson trade on a guy who just never figures it out. Maybe never even really plays very much football because of off-the-field stuff. There's also a scenario where we don't draft him Somebody like Detroit does, and he goes on to become a five-time All-Pro. And that's just as bad. And the only real thing that can go one way or the other with Jalen Carter, the only thing in question is really, will his head allow him to achieve the results that his body dictates? This guy, I mean, even the people who don't want Jalen Carter and don't like Jalen Carter, most of them don't say anything about him, bad about him as far as what he can do on a football field. They talk bad about more the mental aspect of Jalen Carter. So let's try to get this one right here. Let's uh, do the best that we can. So Georgia Bulldog, two-time national champion, 22 years old by the time the season starts, so still pretty young. He measured out at the combine at six foot three, three hundred and fourteen pounds, which was heavier than I expected. Um, it's worth noting that at his pro day two weeks later, he came in at two hundred and I'm sorry, three hundred and twenty three pounds, which is really not what we needed. But um, there are mitigating circumstances there that you may or may not be okay with. Arms pretty long, thirty three and a half inches. Hands pretty big, ten and a quarter. 
You look at the big boards, every single big board has him in the top three except for ESPN. ESPN actually has him 13th. I'm pretty sure they did that because of the stuff that was happening off the field with him and maybe his pro day. But all these other big boards still have him in their top three. Pro Football, um, I'm sorry, Mock Draft Database has him number four. So this guy, look, he may be there at number five. At this rate, it's looking like he is going to be there at the number five overall pick. That's probably going to happen. But I don't think he's really falling further than that. At this point, some people were theorizing, oh, he could fall to like, you know, the teens, he could fall to like 20, uh, he could fall to like 9 or 10. I, I don't think, I honestly don't think he's falling past 8. I can't imagine that. So you're going to have to spend a top pick if you want Jalen Carter, I think. So the last two years, he's played in a lot of games, uh, 13 games last year, 14 games the year before. He has amassed about 70 tackles, um, 69 tackles to be precise. Makes a decent number of plays in the backfield. Seven tackles for loss last year, eight and a half the year before. So he'll give you one every couple games. Uh, six sacks, um, not a huge sack guy, which, by the way, that when you look at Georgia and the way they use Jalen Carter, that should not be a surprise. Uh, he's knocked down a handful of passes over the last uh, two years as well. Forced a couple fumbles last year. And he's been the best player on a defense that ranked number one two years ago and number five a year ago. So the resume is there. I know these numbers are not going to blow anybody away, but Jalen Carter is not about the numbers, people. That That's not really the problem here. So let's talk about Jalen Carter as a player in the positives. Um, there's a lot of positives to talk about with him. He um, Look, he can impact running plays and passing plays. Like, this is not a one-dimensional nose tackle guy. Some people are saying, oh, if we got Jalen Carter, we'd use him as like a nose tackle. But he can impact the run and the pass. He's getting pass rush. He's making plays as a penetrator in the backfield on running plays. He can impact both play, both types of play. And he he's not somebody who just hangs around in the middle of the defense. He chases down plays from behind. He chases plays down uh, when he's on the weak side, the the strong side, all up and down the line of scrimmage, he's making plays. He played so many different roles. Like, I was watching the Oregon tape with Jalen Carter uh, a little bit ago. I was watching that Oregon tape, and yeah, he's lining up inside like a defensive tackle, but there are plays where he's lining up on, on the edge as a defensive end. And I believe if you look over the last couple years in Georgia, he's played zero tech, one tech, three tech, five tech. He's done it all. Now, obviously, he's going to be better at some of those things than others, and in the NFL, he'll probably need to find his best role, but in college, he was really, really versatile. He's somebody who can take up blockers, you know, he's somebody who can eat up the double teams, and he can also be the penetrator. He can split gaps, he can get into the backfield and make plays, He's he can wear both hats, he can be a guy who absorbs attention so other people can make plays, and he can be the guy who makes plays. He's extremely strong. Like, there are some plays. There was this one play against Oregon where he just ragdolled. Um, it might have been TJ Bass, who is a good college offensive lineman, just ragdolls him into the backfield. And that strength can get him by in situations where otherwise he wouldn't be doing all that much. He's got a pretty wide variety of pass rush moves as well. This is not somebody who can only bull rush. And when, when he's fresh, he's very quick off the snap. And overall, look, you don't find the mix of strength and athleticism that you see in Jalen Carter every day. It, it's rare you find a player like this, period. So when the opportunity is there to take a guy who is probably one of the two best players in the draft at number five, I'll admit it, you probably have to do it. I can acknowledge that. So let, let's talk about some of the negatives here. And you guys know I've made videos about Jalen Carter specifically many times in recent weeks. But on the field, he does need to refine his technique and develop even more pass rush variety. Um, he has a swim move that is good, but sometimes he uses it too much. And like, um, you know, some people have pointed out that he'll expose his chest. And sometimes offensive linemen can just get their hands up into it when he's doing the swim move and neutralize him. And he needs to f refine other pass rush moves so he doesn't use the swim move constantly like that. He can get out leveraged sometimes. Sometimes he doesn't win the, uh, he doesn't get low enough. Sometimes the offensive lineman gets lower than him and wins that battle. 
there was the bad pro day and there are the off-field issues. Now, let me say this real quick. If you are somebody who looks at Jalen Carter and you're turned off by the off-the-field stuff with the the um, what happened with the car accident, the uh, 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 speeding after winning the national title, being involved in some capacity in an incident that got one of his teammates killed, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And believe me, I'm aware of it. I'm very aware of it. And I'm not one of these people who just completely blows it off. There are definitely people out there who completely blow it off. But I don't know if it's enough. That's the thing. In fact, right now I'm thinking it may not be enough to push me off of him completely. You know, life, not just being an NFL decision maker, but just life in general is about taking risks. Sometimes you look at something and you go, me doing this is going to be a massive risk. And then you do it anyway, because you know it's the right thing to do. Life is a never-ending cycle of looking at a situation, making a decision that you know can go bad, and then you make that decision anyway because it's the right thing to do. But I'm, I want to be clear about this. I am not one of those people who completely ignores the conditioning issues, although I will say that is something that should be easily correctable. I'm not somebody who ignores the off-the-field stuff. There are red flags there. And believe me, if the Seahawks do take Jalen Carter at number five, I'm going to be nervous. There's no universe where I'm jumping up and down about it. I'm acknowledging it's probably the right thing to do, but believe me, there will be a part of me that wishes I could just hibernate for a few years, wake up and see how his career turned out. But anyway, he's a top two player in the class. He comes with baggage and risk. Drafting him anywhere in the top 10 is intimidating, but I do think it's worth it. Overall, I'd say he's a scary but likely necessary risk you need to take in the top five, and that's my take there. All right, see you guys later. Another video to later today. Go Hawks.